like to honor for inviting me back today. The last time I was here, I gave a lecture on Zippo Follies, those Zippo girls, and I was wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> for this lecture, I certainly don't need my tuxedo. So what you're looking at, if you look at the cemetery, you're watching uh, people in the 1940s in a movie theater watching a newsreel. Back in that war, in that, in that war, the only way you could see film footage of the war was by going to a movie theater and watching a newsreel. Television wasn't out during World War II. Television came out around 1948. And as you know, the war was over in 1945. So uh, uh, a person would uh, leave their home at around 12 noon. Uh, they would go to a movie theater, pay 12 cents to get in. Uh, see a double feature, coming attractions, cartoons, uh, Flash Gordon, uh, the Three Stooges, Bride of Frankenstein, and then World War II newsreels, and then at about 5.30 p.m., uh, they would exit the theater, walk across the street, and buy a potato canvas for a nickel. Yeah, that was back then in the 1940s. So back then, you know, there was no CNN. There was no Fox News. You didn't have the media culture wars there between the right and the left. So what I want to do, I'm going to start off my lecture by showing you a newsreel from World War II. But I don't want to show you a newsreel with battle scenes. Because nowadays, practically every day, day you see battle scenes on your television. So I'm going to show you a newsreel of the airborne division at the World War II marching up Fifth Avenue. Dutch. Well, we get waffles from the Dutch, bread, 
The Dutch believed that bread would prep the stomach up for the main course. And we get Santa Claus from the Dutch. We took their patron, St. Nicholas, and from St. Nicholas, we created the secular Santa Claus. Santa Claus, to this day, one of the greatest merchandising achievements of all time. And then, when the British found out about the greatest harbor in the world, and the potential for making a lot, making a lot of money in New York, well then the British decided to settle New York, back in 1664. And when they arrived, the Dutch were no match for the British, not a shot was fired. It was a very smooth transition. When the Dutch arrived, they named the city New Amsterdam, and as soon as the British arrived, the Dutch left the city of New Amsterdam, the British walked right in, renamed the city New York after the Duke of York. And then the British ushered in the American Revolution. The first great battle of the American Revolution occurred in Brooklyn. It was known as the Battle of Brooklyn, where Greenwood Cemetery is today. The battle commenced August 27, 1776. And every year in the month of August, on a Sunday, close to that day, they commemorate that event. I've been to it, it's a very emotional event. If you haven't been to it, I would suggest you put it on your calendar. And if you do go, when you get there, you get to Greenwood Cemetery, you're gonna go to Battle Hill. It's the top of the hill at the cemetery where that first great battle was fought. And when you get there, you're gonna see a large statue of a goddess. And that goddess is Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. And I want, what I want you to do when you get there, I want you to stand directly behind Minerva. And I want you to look straight ahead. When you look straight ahead, you're going to see Lady Liberty looking at Minerva. Lady Liberty looking at the uh, site where the first great battle of the American Revolution occurred. Lady Liberty looking at the struggle for liberty. A number of years ago, a developer wanted to put up a high-rise condominium between the two great ladies. And preservationists in the city of New York said, you can't do that. You can't block this historical view between the two great ladies. So they took the developer to court and the developer lost. The judge ruled in favor of the preservationists and the condominium never went up. And then we got the War of 1812. The British again. In the War of 1812, New York built up their first coastal defense system and fortifications that really were not used during the World War II, I mean, uh, uh, War of 1812. Uh, uh, the British sacked Washington, D.C., but not New York. And then after World War II, we recovered the uh, maps from Gordon. He was the aviation minister for Hitler. And one of the maps revealed that Crown Zero was Bowery and Delancey Street. The blast would have gone as far as Rockefeller Center. So New York was in their sights. New York was a target. Hitler uh, uh, sent a note to Albert Speer, his chief architect, and this is what he said about New York. This is Hitler now. Going down in a sea of flames, with the skyscrapers turned into towers of flame. Actually, uh, uh, Germany was working on a bomber that could take off from France, bomb New York City, and then return to France without refueling. So New York has the busiest harbor in the world. And during World War II, soldiers from all over America would arrive to the docks in New York, board troop ships that would take them to the European theater. And then after the war, again, troops from all over America would return on troop ships to the same docks in New York. Uh, Fritz Julius Kuhn uh, was known as the American Fuhrer. He was the head of the American Nazi Party, the German-American Bund. And they had their headquarters on East 85th Street. We're talking about 1939 now. Now, it's interesting how the Germans got up to Yorkville, or East 85th Street. When the Germans first arrived in New York, they came over in the 1840s. There was a lot of political unrest in Germany. There was an industrial revolution going on in Germany. 
and the skilled German craftsmen could not compete with the machinery in the factories. So about 100,000 Germans settled in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And then in 1904, uh, the German community had a church picnic. Only women and children went on this church picnic. Uh, their husbands were working, and they went on a boat. It was called the uh, General Slocum. They went along the East River and caught on fire. The captain should have gone to the shore. That's what he should have done, but he didn't. He sped up. And because he sped up, the flames became greater and greater, and uh, the lifeboats were defective. The crew wasn't prepared for a rescue effort. No one could swim. So about 1,100 uh, German women and children died as a result of the General Slocum disaster. It was considered one of the worst disasters in the history of New York. But the Germans that were still in the Lower East Side, they had to get out of the area because of the poor memories that they had, and they moved out to Yorkville or East 85th Street. So a lot of the German-American punters were in Yorkville, but there were punters throughout the city as well. So in February 20th, uh, 1939, the German-American Bundes held a rally at Madison Square Garden. About 20,000 Bundes showed up. And here it is. Imagine that 1939 pro-American Nazi party Bundes. Here's a portrait of George Washington. Uh, George Washington's birthday was February 23rd, and this rally was held close to George Washington's birthday. In the next slide, you're going to see swastikas right next to George Washington's portrait. <coughs> Incredible, right? 1939, New York, Madison Square Garden. At that time, Madison Square Garden was on 50th Street and 8th Avenue. And here they are doing the Nazi salute in that same rally. Maya Lansky was a, a Jewish gangster. He worked for the United States government underground, though. And Maya Lansky would take his boys to these German rallies in New York, and he, they would beat up the Germans. Sometimes they were thrown out of windows. But Maya Lansky didn't want to kill the Germans. He just wanted to inflict some very serious injury to them. And Nazi arms, legs, and ribs were broken, and skulls were cracked, but no one died. <laughs> so here's the German-American boy marching up Fifth Avenue, 1939. So in the summer, uh, the German-American brothers had a camp, a uh, summer camp for adults. It was an adult camp, Camp Siegfried. And every Sunday morning, uh, the German-American brothers would go to Pennsylvania Station Again, on a train, it was called the Camp Siegfried Special, and it would take them to Brookhaven, Long Island, where they would recruit additional members into the Bund, Bund Society. And now, this was an adult camp, so their children went to a summer camp in the Catskills. And here they are pitching tents. The ages of the children here were from 8 to 18 years old. And again, this was around 1938, 1939. What's interesting about the summer camp, it was in the high schools. This camp was located only 60 miles from Grossinger's Hotel Resort in what we call the Borscht Belt of the, uh, the high schools. So what happened is when war broke out in 1941, the Brutus were dissolved. Fritz Kuhn lost his citizenship and he had to go back to Germany. And then a pro-American German society was formed, the Stuben Society. Japan bombing Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. December 8, 1941, Mayor LaGuardia addressing New Yorkers. Uh, many people consider Mayor LaGuardia the best mayor ever in the city of New York. He certainly represented the ethnic diversity of the city. His mother was Jewish, his father was Italian, his first wife was Catholic, his second wife was Protestant. <laughs> That's what we call ethnic diversity. He, he was an interpreter at Ellis Island. And you know, May LaGuardia was a short man. And they referred to him as a little flower. And one day he gave a political speech 
And a reporter yelled out, Mayor, can you stand up? <laughs> and he said, damn it, I am standing. So December 8, 1941, he addressed New Yorkers and he said, you know, if Pearl Harbor was attacked, we were in their sights. He told New Yorkers, it's not if we're attacked, it's when we're attacked. So all tunnels, bridges, factories, and shipyards were put on high alert. The New York City Harbor was put on alert. Japanese nationals were arrested and some were sent back to Japan. The New York Public Library evacuated its most important works and the Metropolitan Museum of Art sent about 15,000 of its valuable works out of town. The city was dim, and no night baseball. All buildings, 15 stories or higher, would have to cover their windows. More than 800,000 New Yorkers served in the armed forces during World War II. So here we have, very not Whitehall Street, this was the U.S. Army building. And uh, December 8, 1941, a lot of men enlisted into the Army and went in. This was the uh, induction center, this is where you would get your physical. Uh, this is where uh, long men, there would be a long line of men with their briefs on, they would bend over, turn their head, and cough. And this is where, in 1967, during the Vietnam War, Arnold Guthrie mentions the U.S. Army building in his song, Alice's Restaurant. The place where you get injected, inspected, detected, infected, neglected, and selected. <laughs> Guthrie was not selected. Kid, we don't like your kind, and we're going to send your fingerprints off to Washington. So here are long lines at 39 White House Road. The building is still standing, by the way. It's now an office building. So, see how the defense bonds? This is a Grand Central Terminal. And here are the soldiers getting ready to, uh, to, to, to leave, going on the, to go on troop ships to the European theater. So the soldiers standing in Grand Central Terminal, they see uh, tanks, battleships, and airplanes to give them an idea of what they were in for. Children of New York were given Mickey Mouse gas masks. <coughs> These were the waves, a female uh, division of the uh, Navy, a wave stood for Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. Uh, they, of course, they didn't go into the battle, but uh, here they are in the subway in New York City. They had just left City Hall, and they were going to a commissioning ceremony at Hunter College in the Bronx. And here they are marching. Uh, here's Hunter, Hunter College, the Jerome Reservoir. Here's an air raid shelter at one of the schools in New York City. Children had a duck on the desk. And you know, these children didn't have cell phones to call their parents about what was going on. So there was a cash rationing regulation that made it necessary to reduce the amount of sugar, coffee, and tea. One cup per person, but one piece per each meal. Yeah. And here's a war ration stamp book. Uh, this book was owned by Mr. James Young. He lived on Coons Road in the Bronx. The observation deck of the Empire State Building, volunteers would go on the observation deck looking for enemy planes. And in the 81st floor, there were showers and, and lockers uh, for the use of the volunteers. Here's an air raid shelter in a subway station in New York City. Uh, 400,000 New Yorkers uh, get him out of there. And he wasn't able to get him out of there. And you know the rest of the story with Anne Frank. This was the U-boat, the German submarine. Germany had the largest submarine fleet in World War II. Winston Churchill wrote, the only thing that really frightened me during the war was the U-boat. Uh, New Yorkers would they, they were more fearful of the U-boat than, than an air attack. Because at that time, the Germans didn't have a bomber. 
that can, you know, take off from, let's say, France and far New York City and go back without refueling. So the New Yorkers' biggest fear was the German U-boat. And what they did along the New York Harbor, it was netting under the entire harbor. So if the German U-boat tried to come in, the netting would wrap around the submarine and bring it to the bottom of the ocean. Now, the U-boats were along the New Jersey and Long Island shores. They destroyed uh, freighters and Earl tankers that were bound uh, for England. In fact, back in uh, 1942, a U-boat torpedo to destroy a Jacob Jones off Cape May, New Jersey, and about 150 crew members uh, died as a result of that. This was Camp Shanks in uh, Orangeburg, New York. It was the largest deembarkation center for the United States Army. Uh, it consisted of over 2,000 acres, and uh, about 1.3 million soldiers passed through Camp Shanks before they embarked to the European theater. And uh, uh, they only spent about 10 days here. When the soldiers got here, they were already battle ready. They already took their basic training. So what they did at Camp Shanks, they would get their inoculations, and they would write out their wills. Now, why did they pick Orangeburg, New York? Uh, they picked it because it was only 20 miles north of New York City, and, uh, and it had two railroads at the time here, the Erie and the New York Central. So this way, they were able to take the troops from Kim Shanks, bring them to the railroad, and then the, the railroad would go to the west side here, where they would get on a troop ship, or sometimes they went to Hoboken, New Jersey, and got on troop ships there. About 75% of the men who were at Camp Shanks participated in the Deep Day invasion at Normandy. So here's the Tappan Zee Bridge. Here's Camp Shanks in Orangeburg, New York. And this is the Piermont Pier. So later on in the war, they didn't take them to the railroad. They, the troop ships went directly to the Piermont Pier, and from there they will go to the uh, European Theater, or drop off some of the soldiers in Hoboken, New Jersey, where they would get on the troop ships there. Now, Camp Shanks uh, has a museum now. They converted one of the barracks into a museum, and here's a picture of it. So here's the Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary, <clears throat> two great uh, ocean liners owned by the Canard shipping line, and during World War II they were refitted as troop ships. The big advantage they had is that they were faster than the German U-boat. And that way, and because of that, they could probably cross the Atlantic in almost a straight line. Now, the Queen Mary could accommodate 15,000 troops, and the Queen Elizabeth, 10,000 troops, and here they are docked at the West Side Pier of Manhattan. This is the School of Ethical Culture, which stands today on 63rd Street and Central Park West. Uh, it's a private school, very prestigious school. And uh, the father of the atomic bomb attended the school, Robert Oppenheimer. Robert Oppenheimer headed the Manhattan Project in New York. When uh, Einstein endorsed a letter to President Roosevelt that the Germans were in the process of making an atom bomb, Roosevelt approved the Manhattan Project. There were about 12 different sites in Manhattan where it took place. The largest of the 12 sites was at Columbia University. At the Pooper Laboratory, uh, the football players were pushed uh, uh, cans uh, of uranium, not realizing what experiment they were involved in. Now, someone asked me the other day, well, why did they pick Manhattan for the Manhattan Project, or why did they pick Manhattan to the place where they were going to make the atom bomb? Well, there are several reasons. One is Manhattan is central. Also, Manhattan has the greatest harbor in the world, so it would be easier to transport the ores they needed to make the atom bomb into New York. The other reason, this is very important, most of the scientists and physicists were already in Manhattan. When Hitler took power in 1933, he fired all the Jewish uh, uh, German physicists from the academies that they were teaching him. And many of the physicists went to New York. Many of them taught at the New School in Manhattan, 
In fact, another name for the new school was University in Exile. Also, when Hitler took power in 1933 in Germany, Einstein was in New York at the time. So, of course, he remained in New York. So that's the other reason most of the scientists and physicists were already in New York. And uh, here's the uh, uh, Robin Oppenheimer. Uh, he grew up in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And about six or seven years ago, the Metropolitan Opera uh, House, uh, right near the school, I had an opera about him. It was called Dr. Atomic. Uh, General Finley, a famous Canadian opera star, played the role of uh, Robin Oppenheimer. And here's the Woolworth Building, uh, one of the great buildings in New York. And this was the headquarters at one time for the Manhattan Project. Now, when you go to these 10 or 12 sites where the Manhattan Project took place, there are no plaques. To this day, there are no plaques indicating that this was the site of the Manhattan Project. And by the way, the uh, top 30 floors now of the Woolworth Building are being converted into uh, high-priced condominiums. So if any of you are interested, I friend at the concierge, they started about two, three million dollars and up to about 70 million dollars. So let me know if you get a lecture, I can probably negotiate a good deal for you. But this was Frank Woolworth's building. Uh, you know, he was the head of the nickel and dime empire. When he built this building around 1904, 1906, he paid $15 million in cash. Didn't take out a mortgage. And uh, he's buried at Woodland Cemetery in the Bronx. Woodland Cemetery is a national landmark and also a non sectarian cemetery. And I went on a walking tour of Woodland Cemetery once. I didn't give the tour. It was given by uh, the chief historian of the cemetery. I was with a group of people. And Woolworth, I think he had the most elaborate mausoleum in the entire cemetery. It looked like an Egyptian temple. There was Sphinx on each side of it. Frank said, if it's good enough for a pharaoh, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and this is the Cunard building down in Lower Manhattan. The building is still standing. Uh, this was where the ticket offices were for the Cunard line were. Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary, and other great ships and luxury liners that they built. So in the 1920s, there would be long lines of people here to get in, buy tickets for the luxury liner, and then all along the west side pier were luxury liners, one right after the other. And uh, now, uh, Edward, Edward Senjian uh, uh, was a managing director of one of the biggest uranium mines in the Congo. And he had his office here. This was during the Manhattan Project. And he had 1,200 tons of uranium transported from the Belgian Congo to this building uh, during the Manhattan Project. <laughs> this was the uh, stage door canteen. It was uh, uh, in the basement of a, a, a theater on West 45th Street in Times Square. And performers from Broadway shows would volunteer their time and perform for the soldiers before they went out uh, to Europe. And here's Ethel Merman entertaining uh, the troops. They were selling war bonds in the lobby of Radio City Music Hall back then. And this is the army we put on by Irving Berlin. It, it played for about three months, about 400 soldiers. Uh, with dancing and singing, and they raised about $10 million from this for the war relief effort. And then eventually it became a film. And it was, it was uh, Kate Smith that sang God Bless America in this live performance. And my mother and my grandmother loved Kate Smith. She was that heavy set lady with the long dress and the long sleeves. She had a, a sense of immortality about her. She never should have died. <laughs> we could use Kate Smith today in Washington, D.C. She could probably straighten out the critical gridlock that's going on here. So Rogers and Hammerstein is certainly one of the greatest ever that appeared at the Broadway Theater. But they did a lot for the World War II effort. Uh, their first show was uh, in 1943, Oklahoma. And Oklahoma was about optimism, about carving out a new state. It appeared at the St. James Theater. And many soldiers 
uh, viewed this performance before they went on the troop ships. So the land we belong to is grand. That's what they're hearing, the land we belong to is grand. So they had a sense of optimism, a sense that it was worth fighting for this country. And uh, oh, what a beautiful morning. We're hearing this in 1943. Harvesting was a true optimist. Uh, you know, corn is high as an elephant's eye, climb every mountain, you'll never walk alone, and oh, what a beautiful morning. And then in 45, they came out with Carousel while the war was still going on, and soldiers were in a the theater watching Carousel. And they introduced a t very interesting technique in Carousel that was very effective for the site for the soldier. Uh, it was called tension and release. So you never walk alone, you're walking through a storm. And the soldiers certainly knew they were walking through a storm. But then there's that golden rainbow. So the heat. soldiers are hearing this before they go out to the European theater. The Brooklyn Navy Yard. The Brooklyn Navy Yard played a major, major role in the World War II effort. They built battleships here. They built aircraft carriers, and they, they repaired ships that were damaged in the war, and repaired them to try to get the ships back in service. So ships would come from the coast of Japan, about 12,000 miles, to the Brooklyn Navy Yard to be repaired. They had uh, six dry docks here, six dry docks, and it was at the dry docks where they would repair ships and make battleships and aircraft carriers. Right after Pearl Harbor was bombed, December 7th, 1941, the following day, the Brooklyn Navy Yard sent ship repair experts to Pearl Harbor to see what ships they could repair from that disaster to put back into service. The blueprints for the battleships and the aircraft carriers were made in Washington, D.C. And the blueprints were sent to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The naval, yard, naval architects would take the blueprints, go on the roof of one of the buildings at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and look down with the blueprint in the hand and try to figure out how they're going to put all the parts of the ship together. 75,000 employees worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It was in operation 24-7 from 1942 to 1945. Outside the gates of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, there were about 80 supporting factories in addition to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The USS Arizona that was born during Pearl Harbor was made at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The USS Missouri, that was the, the ship where the deck uh, surrendered, made in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So there's an interesting story about repairing a ship. It was the USS Franklin, also known as Big Ben. It was an aircraft carrier, and back in March of 1945, it had 31 fuel, fuel, fully fueled aircraft on its deck. And it was only about 50 miles from the Japanese mainland. This is the closest any aircraft carrier had ever gotten to the Japanese mainland. And then in March of 1945, a Japanese bomber dropped a 500-pound bomb onto this aircraft carrier, decimated the deck. And of course, the planes were fully, fully fueled, so the, the flames were, were huge. And, and about 800 men died as a result of this. So he had to have, they destroyed a, a big bend. They took it to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, 12,000 miles through the Panama Canal. And here it is arriving in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Look at the deck. Yeah, there's the New York Harbor. So here we have women entering the Brooklyn Navy Yard. With so many men enlisting, there was a shortage of labor now. So they were hiring uh, females, and uh, uh, some of the fathers didn't want their daughters working in the Brooklyn Navy Yard with all those men. But the, the ladies were a big asset. They, uh, they were great welders. Uh, they can fit into spaces. Their smaller body frames can fit into spaces that men could not fit into. And then there was a lady by the name of Sylvia Everett who worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard with, with men. 
And she said, I had never cursed in my life. And this language is very attractive. <laughs> it has remained with me the rest of my life. By 1945, about 4,500 women worked in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And here is Rosie the Riveter. She represented the female worker during World War II. And look at this female river. Now, most men can fit into that space. They had that smaller body frame. Now, the female riveters drank a lot of milk. Uh, there was a rumor that the fumes from the well-being was not good for your lungs. And there was a theory that milk was good for your lungs. We don't know if that was you know, true or not, but they thought it was and they drank a lot of milk. This is a Grumman aircraft and Beth Page Long Island. And here's Grumman again and Beth Page Long Island. These stowaway, stowaway planes with the folded wings were designed by, uh, again, Grumman in Long Island. The USS Arizona was born during Pearl Harbor. Of course, was made at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. This was the Alva. It was a yacht owned by William K. Vanderbilt. He was the grandson of the Commodore. It was a $3 million yacht. He named it the Alva because his wife's first name was Alva. Uh, a number of wealthy men belonged to the Cruising Club of America, and they would donate their yachts. They were armed with machine guns looking uh, for uh, German U boats. Penicillin. Charles Pfizer, an emigrator from Germany, and he opened up his first uh, plant in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. <laughs> And during World War II, Pfizer produced large quantities of penicillin uh, for the soldiers. These are the P-47 Thunderbolts made by Republic in Long Island. These landing crafts that carried American troops onto the beaches of Normandy were made uh, by Todd Shipyards in Red Oak, Brooklyn. So New York played a major, major role in the World War II effort. This was the Normandy, a great French luxury liner that were all time grapes. And during the war, they were refitting it uh, to be a troop ship. And the rumor is that uh, during the refitting, one of the welders torch uh, set off a spark and set the ship on fire, and then it capsized uh, here. It is at the West Side Pier. Maya Levin was born in Brooklyn, participated in the 50 raids in the Pacific, he got killed in action, and he received a Purple Heart. And this is what his father said upon learning that his son was killed in action. The cause for which our boy died is freedom for all of us at home. This is the American Merchant Marine Memorial. It's a sculpture that was done by Maricel Escobar, and uh, there was a Merchant Marine ship that was destroyed by a German U-boat. And the Germans just stood there and let these uh, merchant marines die. And they didn't try to rescue them. One of the Germans took a picture, and it seems that Aris Maricel Escobar got a hold of the picture and created the sculpture. But it's my favorite sculpture in all of New York. It's located at the Battery. Here you have a merchant marine on his knees. This merchant marine is yelling for help. And this merchant marine is trying to grab the hand of the drowning soldier. The drowning soldier emerges and recedes with the tide. So sometimes you don't see the drowning soldier at all, and here you do. It's a really, really great sculpture. If you haven't seen it, I would try to make it a point of seeing it. You go down to the battery, and uh, it's right by Pier A. So as you're coming down at the battery, make a right turn and go to Pier A, and that's where the sculpture lives. Here's the Queen Mary arriving in June of 1945 with thousands of soldiers after the war. Right the end of the war with Japan, like I said before, Times Square to this day is still one of the greatest gathering places in the world. And Mayor LaGuardia and General Eisenhower had a ticket tape parade at Broadway. And here's a block party. Block parties were held throughout the city of New York after the war. A 
And you're the lawyer? Yeah. The deck of USS Missouri with a Japanese surrender, and I mentioned before, the ship was made at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. This is a, a Shinrin statue. Shinrin was a Buddhist monk, and this statue stood outside of a Japanese uh, temple uh, in Hiroshima, Japan. Hiroshima, Japan. And it, so it survived. Uh, it was about one and a half miles from the center of the atomic blast in Hiroshima. Survived the blast unscathed. And then after the war, a Japanese businessman had the statue shipped to New York, which stands today outside a Buddhist temple at 105th Street on Riverside Drive. It was supposed to represent uh, a symbol of world peace. So I wanted to, I wanted to end the lecture on a positive note, but I had a difficult time with that. Uh, because um, I generally like to end my lectures on a positive note. A friend of mine said, well, why don't you just mention that the war is over and we defeated the enemy? Well, we defeated that enemy, but there's a new enemy now. You know, since 9-11, there's a bubble of uncertainty in the air in New York. New York, to this day, is still the most vulnerable city in the world. If you go down to Wall Street, it looks like a damn battle zone. There are soldiers down there with machine guns and box sniffing dogs, hidden cameras all over the place, uh, anti-radiation devices are down there, and there are sharpshooters on rooftops. Looks just like a pound. About two weeks ago, I was in Pennsylvania Station with my grandson, and at different parts of the station, there were soldiers with assault rifles and box sniffing dogs. So my grandson looked up at me, and he said, why? And what a great question, why? And that's what people all over the world are asking now, why? Uh, you know, we can take a quote from that great uh, Scottish poet, Robert Burns. He talks about man's inhumanity to man. The first human born, Cain, killed his brother Abel. And it hasn't stopped since then. So what I'm going to show you is the last image. Is this the image? It's the Seattle Kissing and Earth in Times Square at the end of the War. This is the first time they met each other. It was taken by a, a well-known photographer, life photographer, Alfred Eisenstadt. So in conclusion, if all the people in the world, all races and religions, can just hug each other, maybe someday this insanity will end. I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Questions or comments?